Amen. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 this morning. Last time we saw the compassion and sadness of Christ for his wayward people. How often over 2,000 years as God, and that's the way he's lamenting for them, as God, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, how often he was willing to gather them as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings to protect them, to deliver them from the enemies. How often he would have done that. But they were unwilling. They resisted him. And so he continually gave them over to judgments, and now it's at the end, now the, the final great cataclysmic, catastrophic judgment is about to fall upon the people of his flesh and blood. The Israels, the Israelite people, the Hebrews, the Jews, and he has warned them now. As he ends his public ministry, no more will he publicly proclaim anything to the nation. He ends his public ministry saying, you will not see me again until you, what? Say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until you receive me as your Messiah, as King, until you do it for real, I'm not, you're not going to see me anymore. That's the last words Jesus said to them. And so in today's passage, we move to the Mount of Olives. Just as when Ezekiel saw the glory of God depart in the vision because Babylon was going to destroy Israel, and he saw the glory go up from the Holy of Holies over the ark to the cherub that carried it to the threshold of the temple, and then to the gate of the temple, and then to the gate of the city. And then he says he saw the, the glory go to the east side of the mountain. The mountain on the east side, rather, which is the Mount of Olives. And that's exactly what Jesus does, who is the glory of the second temple. He made the second temple more glorious because he himself, God himself, showed up. Not in a theophany, not just in a cloud or a fire or smoke or an angel. God in the flesh walked into the temple. It was the most glorious moment of all, and they rejected him. And so the glory departs. And it goes out of the city to the east, exactly what Ezekiel saw. Jesus sits down on the Mount of Olives, and we're about to begin the, well, the last discourse of Christ in Matthew. You've probably heard that Matthew is divided by these large discourses. That's the way Matthew chose to record in the, in the inspiration of the Spirit, but that's how he did it, uh, these discourses. And this is the last big discourse of Christ in Matthew, and it's called the Olivet Discourse because he's on the Mount of of olives. It's also called Christ's eschatological discourse because it has to do with the things of the end or his discourse on the last things. It's been called all those things and it comprises all of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Can't just stop at Matthew 24. The Olivet Discourse is 24 and 25. It's in Mark, it's in Luke, but Matthew gives us by far the fullest version of the Olivet Discourse especially in chapter 25, telling us many things that we don't find in Mark or Luke. And so this chapter begins that discourse we're about to start. And the, the whole teaching begins based on a confused and misunderstood idea that the Jews have at the time, his disciples have, the 12, and they come to him in this confusion and they ask him this question that's mixed with some faith in his word, but it's also mixed with their own ideas and the false teaching of their day. But through that, Christ gives us this invaluable teaching on how we can live for him, really, until the end of the world. And so let's ask God's blessing as we turn to God's word. Father, again, we pray for your blessing. We pray that you would give us ears to hear, that you would give me the right understanding and interpretation and proclamation of this word of truth, that I would not wade into things that I don't know or, or aren't true, but that you would help us to see what is here, and that most of all, we would know you more, and that we would be quickened in our service and duty to you more in real growing faith and repentance, for we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 24. This is God's holy and perfect word. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? 
Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? May the Lord establish this word in our hearts this morning, we pray. I want you to notice, first of all, an external fondness. I want you to notice an external fondness. Verse 1, then Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. What's going on here? Jesus has spent a long day in the temple. He's been teaching for quite a while. It's probably early evening or late afternoon. And he has called down those thunderous, those oracles of woe, eight woes upon the leadership of Israel. And he has rebuked them in terms like vipers, hypocrites, serpents, whitewashed sepulchers, fools, blind. He's called them all these things to their faces. And now after saying to them and blaming all of the, the guilt of all of God's servants, laying it on them, saying they're going to be held guilty for murdering all the servants and that they themselves are going to murder his servants and that's how they're going to fill up that guilt and receive that punishment. And then he says, how will you escape the condemnation of hell? I mean, Christ publicly says these guys are going to hell. And then he leaves. And these, remember, these are the religious and civil leaders of God's people. You don't talk to them this way. They're not used to being spoken to this way, especially from some nobody rabbi in Galilee. This is Jerusalem. This is the big city. This is the capital city. You don't talk to us that way. I guarantee you there was murder in their eyes when Jesus turned and walked out. And Jesus was furious and Jesus was sorry. Because the two last things he said was how he woe or how he uh, lamented for his people, and then how your house is left to you desolate. And he leaves. And the tension is in the air like nothing that none of us have ever experienced because we've all had those awkward moments, right? Where we hear a couple fighting or something, and you're sitting there and like, oh my goodness, and you know, and you don't want to be there, and, and it's awkward. Or something like that, you know, a teacher chewing out a student in the class and the student, you know, yells back or something. You know, oh, my goodness. We've all been there. But this is like, this is war. Christ has pronounced the judgment, the going to hell of the Jewish leaders. And they are already plotting to kill him. And I do not doubt that our Lord, who is in control, did this in order to provoke them to act sooner than they would. They're on his timetable. They had said earlier, not during the feast, but guess what? It's Tuesday, Thursday night, they're coming to arrest him. During the feast, they couldn't hold back anymore. They were so mad, they were so seething with rage, but they can't act because the crowd thinks he's a prophet. They just watched his miracles because he healed the lame and the, and the lepers who came into the temple the day before. They can't do anything to him, but boy, they want to kill him. So you're in the midst of that. You're in that situation. You're one of the disciples. You're walking out of the temple complex with Jesus and you're seeing all of the, the civil and religious leaders, all of them, wanting to kill your master and you know something huge is going to happen. So what do you do? Hey, Jesus, look at all the buildings. Aren't these awesome? You try to cut the tension, you know, distraction. Mark actually says, chapter 13, verse 1, this is what they say. Mark records their words. Teachers, see what manner of stones and what buildings these are. What else are you going to do? What are you going to say? That's what they say to him. Check out the buildings. They're really something. Jesus has just said, this house is desolate. He's called that house a den of robbers the day before when he cleansed that house and overturned their tables and threw their money anywhere and drove them out. But they're enamored with the external, the beauty of the temple. Let me just say something. The external is important. The external is necessary. 
It was good and right that they built a beautiful temple. The first temple, all of it was done. And and if you look back to the tabernacle, the finest little details specifically commanded by God and when Solomon builds that temple and it's, it's, it's plastered with gold and it's beautiful gold. In fact, the gold, gold was so common in Israel and silver was so common that silver was counted as nothing during Solomon's days, but it was especially the temple. And they should have done that. All of that beauty. In fact, God says when he makes the commandments for the robes and all these other things, he says it's for glory and for beauty. Beauty matters. We are to seek Beauty, we are to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now that's internal, but the external was important. God had all those commandments, all those beautiful robes and turbans and all the things that they wore and the temple itself, ornate and beautiful, and it was good and right that it was. But if that's all it is, or if that becomes the goal, or if that becomes what we think we are acceptable to God for because why, it's so beautiful outwardly, then we've missed it. We've, we've made it into an idol. You know, I can't help but think I love this building that we were able to build this and we started worshiping here in 2016. And it's beautiful and we built a sanctuary. We didn't build a conference hall, thank God. We believe in worship in excellence, extravagant worship spending more money than we need to because it's for the worship and glory of God. It's beautiful. We want beauty. It's good. The external is good. Husbands, you do this. I hope you do this. You buy your wife flowers. They're beautiful. In Coriopolis, they're like $60 a dozen. (laughs) It's a lot of money. And they're just going to die What's the point? I mean, you think about it, right? Because it's for glory and it's for beauty. Because your wife's worth it. And you want to honor her and you want to give her something beautiful and you want to spend money on that and let that money go away, but you've given her that praise just for the sake of beauty and honor and delight. There's no other end. There's no, what am I going to get out of it? How's this going to benefit us? What's this going to look like on the bottom line? It's for glory and for beauty. We should strive for the most excellent, the most extravagant worship we could give to God. But I'll tell you what, if that would ever become the reason why we would pride ourselves or the thing that we would look in confidence to, well, look at this church. This isn't the church. We're the church. I thank God for this building. We want to keep this building beautiful. We want to continue to make it beautiful. But the the spiritual internal is the key. And those beautiful buildings that we see in Pittsburgh, you know, you go to those churches, and I've talked to Jim about this a lot, Carpenter, he knows. These beautiful buildings, we have them in Coriopolis. Beautiful church buildings that no one would build today. No one could build today. No one could afford to build today. Stained glass windows that are worth $100,000 or more. And they poured their, their money into these buildings because they believed in extravagant worship. And it was, they're, they're still glorious to see those buildings. They're amazing. Yet they're empty. Because they lost the internal. And the minister stopped preaching the word of God. And they prized themselves in the external. And with the external comes the love of the world and the praise of the world. And you want to get along with the world and then you've got to get rid of the word. Because the word is light and darkness. And the word is righteousness in the midst of wickedness. And the word is good versus evil. And it is white and black. True or false. For God or against God. And that doesn't go along with worldliness. And that's what we see here in the disciples, unfortunately. They're enamored with this temple. Jesus said, the house is left to you desolate. And they say, Lord, look at the stones. Surely this temple needs to remain. Surely this outward building needs to stay. It needs to be here. It's so amazing. It's so beautiful. There's so much glory here. This building needs to stay. Matthew Henry sees this as man's natural tendency to idolatry. 
Jesus called the temple a den of robbers, and they want to just look at the stones. He says, quote, even good men are apt to be too much enamored with outward pomp and gaiety and to overvalue it, even in the things of God, whereas we should be, as Christ was, dead to it and look upon it with contempt. Christ too, or Calvin, too, finds fault. He says, quote, that they were infatuated by that superstition of an earthly kingdom of Christ. Yet listen to this. Calvin goes on. Yet today, scarcely one person in a hundred is to be found who does not labor under a very similar disease. In Calvin's day, he's saying that. We want an earthly kingdom. We want to be enamored with the external. We want this, this fondness. We have this natural fondness that moves beyond the external to the world. We want to get along with the world. We want the world to like us. We want things to go well. We don't want the leaders of the, the church and the state to be mad at us. We don't want to storm out of the temple with them looking at us with murder in their eyes because we won't compromise the word of God. We want to find a way. We want to make peace with unrepentant sinners and get along with them and have a good time for our three score and ten. And the external becomes the worldly, unfortunately. And the reason why this is, is unacceptable is because God is going to judge this place and destroy it utterly, this temple. This isn't the temple of Zeus. This isn't some evil, false religion. This isn't some horrible den of actual thieves. This isn't some corrupt government, some tyrannical king. This is the outward people of God. They have good reputations. They're beautiful on the outside. They're nice people. They're in the temple. They're religious people. They're good people. Outwardly, Jesus says they're beautiful, like whitewashed sepulchers. Inwardly filled with wickedness, and Christ is going to utterly destroy them. That's why we cannot, beloved, we cannot compromise. We cannot accept some worldliness. A little bit. You know, I was reading in my devotions in Exodus and how Moses goes to Pharaoh. Let my people go. You know, Pharaoh says no. Moses goes again. Pharaoh says no. Moses goes again. Pharaoh says, well, you know what? You can go. Just, you know, leave your little ones. I guarantee you if that happened today, there would be so many people around Moses saying, that's good enough. Don't, you know, we're getting something here. That's enough. Let's make peace with the world. Let's get, we'll be able to go. We'll be able to worship. That's all God really wants. Pharaoh offers, if you read that story closely, repeatedly he offers partial obedience. There would be so many today in the church, so many today in the leadership that would put pressure. Oh, that's enough. Come on. You can't have it all. That's enough. Leave the flocks and herds. Just go here. Leave the little ones. Look what he's willing to do. Beloved, it's darkness and light. We compromise a little when we're darkness. There is no compromise. Not when it's obedience to God. This is why Jesus thundered against sin in the temple, thundered against it. And this is why faithful ministers have to do it today because the sheep are being devoured by the wolves. And it's the sins of the day, not some generalities and vague, Jesus is going to be with you, calling out the sins of the day. I challenge you who say you're reformed and don't like this, read the sermons of Calvin. Just sit down and actually read them. Read the sermons of Luther. You will be scandalized how they call out the sins of their day happening right now, so much so that we kind of like, I don't think you should say that in a sermon. You see, that's what Reformation is. They were in the midst of a Reformation, so they were light, and they didn't mess around with darkness. And that's why we're not, because we want to go along and get along. And that's the difference. By calling out the sins of the day, not only do we rebuke the wolves, but we, we help the sheep, right? Because nobody's going to even begin to, to flirt with sin. Nobody's even going to begin to go there because we're going to be horrified to even go there because the ministers just called it the worst thing in the book. And so we don't want to go there now, right? It builds up the sheep. Because what happens otherwise, because of our natural fondness for the world, is we're like the frog in the proverbial water. 
the world starts to make it a little warmer and a little warmer. And we really don't notice it. And it's a little warmer. And pretty soon you've got a bunch of churches saying, hey, you know what? Homosexuality is okay. I mean, come on. These couples get along fine. They love each other. It's okay. And you know, that's okay now. And then the next one. And then the next one. And then the next one. Because we don't take sin and make it the most ghastly, horrible thing and say, no, we will never go there. Because as soon as you start, and we're seeing it all around us, compromise, 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 a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Why do you think those beautiful churches are empty? Those are the mainline churches. Go look at what they're teaching now. And that's where the evangelicals want to go today. Beloved, I can't say it enough. Jesus is going to destroy this place. In our own fleshliness, we shrink from duties, we shrink from crosses, we don't want controversy. We don't like difficulties. We don't want struggle. We want pleasure. We want comfort. We want rest. We want peace. Peace with the world. And there is no peace with the world. There is the gospel to the world. Come and be saved. But we're not going to make peace with darkness. Lord, can't these beautiful buildings be spared? Verse 2. Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, amen, I say to you, this is definitely going to happen, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so secondly, I want you to notice a shocking prophecy. I want you to notice a shocking prophecy. They could scarcely believe that the temple would ever be destroyed. They could scarcely believe it. Beloved, how could those buildings be destroyed? We need to get back and to see the temple again in Jerusalem. The temple complex, and you can read this in different histories, and depends upon how long we make the cubit. Is it a royal cubit, like 20 inches? Is it a common cubit? But in general, these numbers are right. And remember, it's not exactly square either, so it depends how you measure. But you can get different things, and I checked a bunch of sources. The temple complex, the whole top, was over 900 feet long. It was more than 1,600 feet wide. It was, at its highest pinnacle, and more than 150 feet tall. That's more than 15 stories. This is the temple complex that we're talking about. There were pillars. There were walls. There were gates. There were colonnades. There were cloisters. Vast staircases. The temple itself, pinnacles outside the temple, but then the temple itself with its porch and its chambers and its side structures and other buildings, all of this on the temple mount, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of the Jews, and then the building. This building was made of marble stone. It was polished to a brilliant whiteness. There were huge, heavy plates of gold, solid gold. There was golden trim all over the place. It was this white marble and golden trim. And when the sun would set or when the sun would rise, it would gleam with an almost heavenly brilliance. That's the temple that we're talking about. And remember, it's the house of God that God commanded his people to build. This wasn't a good idea. This was commanded to be built. Surely Rome wouldn't destroy this temple. Surely no one would want this temple destroyed. If you read in Josephus, the wars of the Jews, when Titus is about to take the temple, he commands his soldiers repeatedly not to destroy it. Don't destroy the temple. Don't destroy it. It was the last stronghold because of the walls, and they got, once they got the wall, they kept retreating back, and the last place was the temple itself. Don't destroy it. Why? Why would they possibly destroy it? It was ornate. It was beautiful. It was, it was such an asset to Rome. They could get rid of the Jews and turn it into a temple to Zeus. You wouldn't want to do anything to this. This thing is a great treasure to you. You would lose tons of, of resources if you would destroy this temple that you could use. Again, get rid of the Jews. It, it's just foolish to do it. The temple itself, Herod the Great, began the renovation in 19 B.C. It was finished in 63 or 64 A.D. Over 80 years to build one building. And I thought our building project was a pain. <laughs> 
That's why in John chapter 2, verse 20, in the first year of Jesus' ministry, 27 AD, they say to him, it has taken 20, sorry, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will destroy it in three days? 46 years in 27 AD. They've got a long way to go because in 63 or 64, they finally finish it. The stones that they're talking about here, again, Josephus tells us, 40 feet long, again, depending on the cubit, 25 feet high, 15 feet wide, one stone. And they were stone upon stone upon stone, and they were perfect, perfectly matched. You couldn't put paper in between them. They were perfect stones, polished, brilliant, white marble, gold plates, gold trim. The rabbinic literature, which is not at all favorable to Herod the Great, says, he who never saw Herod's edifice has never in his lifetime seen a beautiful building. There was nothing like it. Alfred Edersheim, the great Jewish who became Christian historian in the 19th century, one of the most knowledgeable people of this time, said, quote, nor has there been either in ancient or modern times a sacred building equal to the temple, whether for situation or for magnificence. And what I'm saying, and why I'm saying all this, beloved, is that Jesus prophesies here. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's 30 AD. Nobody in their right mind thinks that there is any chance in the world of this temple ever being destroyed in their lifetimes. Judea had Roman no, nation, uh, Roman Empire favored nation status. In 6 AD, they become a province. They become um, a royal province. They're, that, they're governed by the emperor himself. That's why Pontius Pilate is a procurator, not a proconsul. The senatorial provinces were run by proconsuls. But the emperor himself ran important provinces, one, ones that they got a lot of grain from or a lot of other resources. And so Judea is given that status. Procurator Pontius Pilate rules for the emperor himself. The Judean religion was protected all over Rome. They had synagogues in every city, 10 cities in Rome, or 10 synagogues that we know of in Rome itself. The Jewish worship was protected by God. We have discovered signs even in the last 100 years that say he who enters this temple, goes beyond this gate, will be responsible for his own immediate death. That's what Rome said. Rome would kill anybody who violated Jewish law in the Temple Mount. Remember, they tried to accuse Paul of that. He brought Gentiles here. They protected their religion. They had favored nation status. No one would have ever thought that this would happen. One of the reasons, in fact, that, that liberal Christianity wants to date, or for so long wanted to date the Gospels well into the second century, and then at least in the very later part of the first century, was because they hate the idea they can't, explain away the idea of fulfilled prophecy, miracle. See, they want to make, they want to make the, the gospels written well after the time of Christ and anybody who knew Christ, because then that allows time for myth to develop. And then you can get this miracle worker, you know, this myth, because nobody's alive that knew better. So they need all that time. There is no serious scholar, serious uh, scholar who, who is respectable, who would doubt today that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written before 70 AD. Some think John was written later, and it's possible that it was. Church tradition is John wrote it late in his life, the Gospel of John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, nobody doubts before 70 AD. Do you see what we have here? Do you see why I'm emphasizing all this? Jesus Christ has predicted something that no one would have ever predicted at the time, and it came true to the letter. We have, we have proven fulfilled prophecy that the whole world has to acknowledge. This man, Jesus Christ, said this would happen. Nobody believed it. Nobody could have ever said it. It's no guess that anyone would have ever made. He says it specifically. It's this temple. He says it for surely. Amen, I say to you, it will definitely happen. He says how it will happen. Not one stone will not be thrown down by violence. And he says when it will happen. All these things will come upon this generation. Verse 36 of chapter 23 and again verse 34 and 35 this generation will by no means pass away till this happens Jesus said all these things he put himself in a box 
He can be proven wrong now. Like all the, you know, we see all the time in, in uh, people saying that the world's going to come to an end because of climate change. Ten years, ten years, and they keep moving the thing. Jesus does this. He gives them a chance to prove them wrong. And it all comes true. Beloved, this is a shocking prophecy. This isn't like one of the oracles of the Sibyls or of Delphi or the nonsense of Nostradamus. Go read Nostradamus sometime. I've read pages of Nostradamus. These generic vagaries that could mean anything. It's like reading your horoscope. You know, and you, oh yeah, that's me. Except when it says bad stuff. Oh, that's that person I don't like. Because <laughs> it's just this vague general nonsense. That's not what this is. A specific, exact, timed prophecy that comes to pass that no one would have ever guessed or said. And so thirdly, I want you to notice a momentous event. I want you to notice a momentous event. Again, it's not possible for us to overestimate the significance of that prophecy, and it's not possible for us to overestimate the significance of the fall and destruction of Jerusalem. The Jews believed that the temple would stand until the end of the world. One of the rabbins said the temple was one of the seven reasons God created the world. Therefore, if the temple falls, the world doesn't have a purpose anymore. Can't fall. It fell that time, yes, the 70-year captivity. Sure, we went through that. That was supposed to happen. But now we're in the land until Messiah comes. And when Messiah comes, it's over. We've won. Israel, you see, the Jewish understanding was Israel can't be defeated. They can't be removed. Israel is the kingdom. It's the final program of salvation. The physical nation, that it, that it, that it was a type that would give way to a spiritual body that it would not be identical with an actual political nation, that's not in anybody's mind. Nobody thinks that. The disciples don't think that. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of the nation. And they're convinced, his disciples, that he's going to conquer. That's what he came to do. He's going to conquer and bring in the fullness of God. All right, the leaders didn't accept him. He's declared woe to them. That must mean that he's going to replace them somehow. Maybe he's going to call it on fire from heaven, but he is going to take the throne. That's what the Messiah has come to do. They welcomed him as king. It wasn't real. He's now declared all these woes. They understand that. The temple's going to be thrown down. Well, that can only mean he's going to build back better. I didn't even plan on saying that, but it just came out. <laughs> but that, that's what it must mean. Because Christ is the Messiah. He's here now. The disciples don't understand he's going to die in three days. We've got to remember that. They have no idea. Remember when he's in the upper room? I'm going to leave you. Why? Well, can we go with you? No. Why? They don't know. I'm going. They don't get it. He's here. The Messiah has come. All the scriptures talk about the Messiah. When he comes, what happens? That's the final judgment. That's the fulfillment of all God's prophecy. This is Jewish eschatology. The eternal life, heaven, the resurrection of the dead, that's, that was a mystery. But they know when Messiah comes, it's all coming. The kingdom of God's fullness on the earth. There is nothing left in Jewish eschatology after the Messiah comes. And they have no idea of two comings. There is no, the Jews, the rabbis, the Pharisees, it doesn't matter. The disciples, they don't have any idea of two comings. What were they arguing about just a couple of weeks before? Who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? Which one gets to sit on your right? Which one gets to sit on your left? It's coming. You're here. It's going to happen. You're going to rule and reign. The final state's coming in. That's their mindset. They're asking him about his coming. That means when are you going to take over? The coming there is parousia. It's not erkamai, I come, I go. Parousia is a royal coming. It doesn't have to be. It can just be normal coming. You don't want to ever technify things. But it is the word that's used when an emperor shows up somewhere. Oh, at his parousia, we saw the emperor, something like that. It means presence, royal presence, his coming. They're saying to Jesus, when are you going to become king? We know you are. You've told us. When are you going to take up the throne? The leaders didn't receive you, so when are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? They're looking for that. The full salvation, the final victory of Israel, it's about to happen. In fact, even after his resurrection, beloved, remember in the book of Acts? After his resurrection, after they see him alive again, and he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, therefore when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's got to be Israel. There's no other idea in their minds. Yeah, okay, the gospel, we're going to preach, but Israel, the nation, 
they're gonna, it's, it's, gonna, it's gotta happen there. They, don't, they can't fathom a removal and a spiritual body from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation that don't have to go up to Jerusalem anymore. That's not on anybody's radar screen. This is why, beloved, in verse 3, they come to Jesus privately. Mark tells us it's Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the four, come to him privately. Do you know why? Because they think they're asking about civil war. Lord, when, when's this going to happen? When, when are we going to do this? When are you going to take over? That's what they're asking. They think it's civil war, so it's shh, privately. While he's on the Mount of Olives. That's what they're asking. That's also why they ask for a sign. What will be the sign? We think of sign as giving information so that we know the future. That's not signs. That's not the Bible signs. The Bible doesn't give signs that way. Remember when Moses is, going, is called by God to go into Egypt to deliver the people. And God says, this will be a sign for you, Moses. When you deliver them, you'll worship me on this mountain. That wasn't a piece of information. That was an encouragement to Moses that I'm going to do this through you. Signs are always given that we will believe God and then do what he calls us to do. We believe him and we're going to do what he said. Think of Gideon. God calls Gideon to fight. An angel appears. Gideon says, Lord, if it's you that appears to me, give me a sign. Because he's afraid. He can't act as God's deliverer. God said I'm going to deliver, but he needs a sign so that his faith is built up. And then what happens? Okay, he believes because the angel does that sign. And then he gets out into the field and he's ready to attack and... What does Gideon do? He starts to worry again. And he puts out, we all know, right? Gideon's fleece. He puts out the fleece. Lord, give me another sign because I'm kind of wavering. God gives him a sign. Then he wants another one. Lord, one more time. This is it. Because maybe it's an accident. Maybe it just happened that way. So he, does, he asks for the exact opposite thing the very next night, the exact opposite has. Now he knows. Now he goes and fights and wins. Because God needed him to believe. So he gave him a sign to encourage his faith so that he would act and be the means of God's deliverance. The same thing happened when God's going to heal Hezekiah. He's going to die and then the prophet goes back in. I'm going to give you 15 years of life. Ask for a sign so that you'll believe. So that you'll be able to walk in what I'm saying that's going to happen. You'll believe it. Ahaz, when God says, I'm going to get rid of Samaria. I'm going to get rid of Syria. And he says, ask for a sign as high as the heavens or as low as the depths. And Ahaz, I'm not going to ask for a sign. And he didn't believe. Signs are given so that we believe that what God has said he's going to do, he will do. So that we will faithfully walk in whatever he calls us to do. Because we know his word is true. That's what the disciples are saying. Give us a sign so if you call us to fight, we'll fight. That we'll be brave enough to follow you. Because we see the sign that it's going to happen. That's the point of the sign. What is the sign? What's the confirmation that it's about to happen? That's the reason for signs in the Bible. And so fourthly, I want you to notice, and lastly... A confused inquiry. A confused inquiry. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus has just said one thing. The temple is going to be destroyed. And they ask about these things. And then they give all these questions. And the reason, beloved, is they see it all as one thing. It's the Messiah having come. The Messiah wins. The Messiah brings in the final age. It's all the same. He's, if he destroys the temple, then that's the end, and he's going to build his kingdom, and that means he's come, and that means it's the end of the age. They see it all as one thing. That's why Mark and Luke don't have uh, your coming and the end of the age. They just say, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of these things? That's all Mark and Luke say, because it's the same thing. All these things come in with the Messiah. The Messiah is the final promise. The Jews get that. There's a sense in which they're right at the second coming, right? The second coming, we know there's going to be a final judgment and all those things. They don't understand that Jesus is here now. It's going to happen now. And so they're asking about your coming, that's your victory into Israel or to Jerusalem as king. The end of the age, the victory of the Messiah brings the end of Fallenness, the end of death, the consummation of all things, the eternal state. We look at these questions with the hindsight of the Holy Spirit's teaching in the church for 2,000 years, and we see all these separate things, right? We see the church as God's kingdom. We understand that, and it's 
given on the earth by the gospel preaching throughout the world. We think of Christ's coming and we say, well, do they mean the, does, does he mean the coming of himself into the heavens or the going at the ascension? Or is it the coming at Pentecost when he empowered the church? Or is it the coming of destruction when he destroys the Jerusalem? Or is it the second coming? We have all those questions. He's here. Your coming is your victory in Jerusalem. They don't see any of those things. We see the end of the age as the end of the Jewish age because that's when the gospel goes out in the, in the Gentiles uh, and the Jewish nation wasn't a nation for 2,000 years. And we see that and the, the end of the Jewish age to them is impossible. There is no end to the Jewish age. The Jews are going to be victorious in the end. They are the kingdom. Calvin says, quote, they associate the coming of Christ and the end of the world as things inseparable from each other. And by the end of the world, they mean the restoration of all things, of course, so that nothing may be wanting to complete the happiness of the godly. It's all coming. Messiah's here. They confound, Calvin says, the perfection of Christ's reign with the commencement of it. And they wish to enjoy on earth what they ought to seek in heaven. That's exactly it. They think it's all about to end, and Christ is just beginning his reign as the king and head of the church. He has now come. He's about to win the victory on the cross, and now the spiritual kingdom begins. William Hendrickson also says the same thing. Quote, they evidently think that the end of the temple means the end of the age or the world. The very form in which the question is cast, the juxtaposition of the clauses, Hendrickson says, seems to indicate that, as these men interpret their master's words, Jerusalem's fall, particularly the destruction of the temple, would mean the end of the world. What had to mean that for them? There's no other framework that they have. They can't conceive of a fulfillment of God's promises, the victory of God's king, the victory of God's kingdom without a political Israel. They can't conceive of that. And I think the reason for it is, part of it, is they, want, they haven't been listening to Jesus in his parables. They haven't been listening to the importance of gospel preaching. They haven't been listening that the real enemy is sin and Satan and the world. And part of it also was they didn't understand the Old Testament well. They spiritualized promises to the Gentiles. The Gentiles will see a great light. We're going to hear some of that tonight, I'm sure, if you come to the Messiah. All those Old Testament passages that Handel put to music talking about the gospel going to the Gentiles. Jesus coming for the Gentiles. That's all in the Old Testament, and they missed it. They spiritualized that. You know how they understood the, the Gentiles coming into the kingdom? When Israel captured them and brought them in as slaves. That was the rabbinical understanding. They'll bring them on their shoulders. Yeah, they'll bring them on their shoulders as slaves. They didn't understand the gospel going out. They spiritualized those promises, and they, they had a certain pride. We're better. It's got to be us. If it's not us, who's it going to be? You know, think of that Pharisee that goes up to the temple. I'm not like other men. Thank you, Lord. I'm not like this publican here. I do all these things. Again, the external. Calvin sees the error of the disciples twofold, thinking a national political Israel is the final manifestation of God's kingdom on the earth and of wanting the victory without the battle. And that's where it's a great lesson for us. The victory without the battle. Calvin says this, quote, they received an answer very different from what they had expected. For whereas they were eager for a triumph as if they had already finished their warfare, Christ exhorts them to long patience. All 12 of them are going to be martyred. They're all going to die. And they think they're going to sit one on the right, one on the left, and they're going to conquer. They don't get it. And Christ has to answer their question that's all confused and, and, and not understanding the right things. And I think we have to see this same kind of thing for us. Because I think our temptation is the same thing as Calvin said earlier. We want the victory. We don't want the fight. Jesus Christ did not raise up his church to enjoy the spoils of another's conquest. He raised the church to fight, to fight the darkness, to storm the, king, the gates of Hades. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That's us. This is the first call to arms. And they're not getting it because they're already basking in the victory. And I think so many Christians want to do that today. It's all going to just 
come together. We just got to stop worrying about what the Bible says. Go along and get along. Calvin says everybody wants to reap. Nobody wants to sow. We are the church militant. I know I've said that multiple times. That's what theologians have called us for hundreds of years. Right now, the church militant, the church at war. We are the church at war. We don't war with weapons. We don't war with physical harm. We war with spiritual weapons. We take every thought captive, which means we are against every thought not from the word of God. We're against it. We take everything captive. We war with the word. We war with the spirit. We war with the truth. And there is no truth in unconverted people who are not with God, but against God by definition. Oh, there's truth in common grace and so forth, but not in the, in the truth of the kingdom of God and the truth of salvation. There is only opposition. Matthew Henry notices the same thing. He says they're more interested in the future than in doing their duty. They don't want it to be uncomfortable. When will these things be, they say. I think this should show great caution for us. We're going to get into, Lord willing, the future prophetic portion, however far in the future it is, but the, the prophetic portion, Lord willing, next week. And I, here's the thing I want us to remember. The most important thing we can learn from Matthew 24 is not what's going to happen. And now I know how to understand the newspaper headlines. The most important thing we can learn from Matthew 24 is who God is, and what duty God requires of us. Our Westminster Standards, Larger Catechism, question five. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what we are to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of us. That's what we need to look for in Matthew 24. We need to want to know who God is more and we need to know what we ought to do in response to who God is more. That's the most important thing. Because if we know that our God is all-powerful and our God is all-good, then we don't need to try to figure out the future. And that's why God hated all the soothsaying and divining and the palm reading and the fortune-telling and the, we have the horoscopes today. Because all of that's about trying to figure out the future. And why would you do that if you believe God's all-powerful and all-good and that you are in the grace of God because of the gospel? Why would you ever care about the future? You should be like a little kid holding his dad's hand He's walking down the sidewalk. He's walking in the mall. He doesn't know where he's going. And he doesn't worry about it because he's with his dad who only is going to take him somewhere that's good. Beloved, what we need to know is our duty. What we need to know and pursue is our duty. Oh, how I love thy law. The godly man strives to know the law. We're going to look at these things. But let's not forget the purpose and the reason. And let's not make these things an idol. For what's more important is who God is and how we are to live for him. That is the topic of Matthew 24. Let's close in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We pray that we would be faithful, that we would not become corrupt, that we would not be idolizing the external, that we would not, Lord God, compromise your word. Father, we have so many enemies, but they're nothing compared to you. All we have to do is just believe what you say and follow it. And even if we die, it will be for our glory. And so, Father, we just pray that you'd give us courage and faith, that we would not be like those who shrink back from battle or from duty, but that, Lord God, we would remember that we have not yet entered our rest. And so help us to take up arms, take up your word, take up your spirit, and fight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.